In part two, we're going to take a look at modeling the cap. Somebody actually said they wanted to see this, so I thought it would make a good tutorial. We're going to start out by using this as a reference, and then these lines are also reference for us. So the first thing that I'm going to do is note that I do have the 3D cursor at the center right here, which is where we want it. And I'm going to come over here and add a mesh, and we're going to do a circle. It's going to be pretty enormous, so I'm going to set this to half an inch. I'm going to leave the vertices at 32. That's actually good for, for what we're doing right here. But I want to rotate it around the x-axis so we can look at this. Okay, so that's a good starting point. I'm not going to try and finesse the size exactly right there. Let's come into the front view. I'm going to press the S key to scale this up. Now, the question is, you see there's this reference that I have right here, this box. And we have the vertices of each point here of the circle. And you don't want to just put it right on there. You're actually going to want to overshoot just a little bit. So let's do this. I'm going to come in here to our circular object, press the tab key to go into edit mode, and we're going to fill this. I'm going to bring up the context menu and invoke fill faces from edges. And then what that's going to allow me to do is come over here and add a subdivision modifier. In fact, let's do this in vertex mode right here just because it's a little bit easier to see the vertices. I'm going to press the S key and scale it up so that the subdivision, I know this is a little bit hard to see, it's the subdivision that's touching the reference line right here, not the vertex, because subdivision is always inset just a little bit from the actual edges and vertices that are driving it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is rotate it by 90 degrees. And then we need to give it some thickness here. So we're going to come over to face mode and then we're going to use extrude along normal. Now, let me just show you. Right now I'm in active tool and that will allow me to just grab it anywhere and operate on it. We're still in subdivision surface, so it's generating this sort of funky subdivision surface object. So let me just turn that off. And then down on the bottom, I'm going to click and pull that down until it roughly matches my reference box. And that works pretty well. So I'm going to press tab and I want to just hide that plane so it's not going to be interfering with what we do. So I'm going to press the tab key again to go into edit mode. Let's operate on the top right here. There's rounding up there. And we've got a line here and a line here that kind of tell us about how big to make it. But remember, whenever you're going to be putting a rounding on something like this, that's going to have a flat area here and a flat area up and down, you want to have a bounding set of polygons between the flat area and the curving area. So that's what we're going to do first. So over here in edge mode, we're going to come over to our friend, the bevel tool, and we want two segments and we want the shape to be one. And since we're in active tool, I can just click, hold, and drag on any of the selected edges and pull down you know, until you get about there. So it roughly matches my demarcation lines here and here. Okay, so I'm going to double click this again. We reconfigure the tool. Let's do four. But this time the shape here needs to be 0.5. Click, hold, and drag on any of the selected edges. And then we can bevel that down until you get about like that. So now we have this boundary set of polygons. If we come over here into front view, we can see those right here. This, this is planar to these right here, and it sits as that boundary between the curving area and the flat area. Okay, now we've got the clipping plane. Let me change the clipping plane here. That's always annoying. It's right here. Clip start. I'm going to change that to 0 0.05. Whereas this is a smaller model, and so you're more likely to run into that. Okay, so on the top, what I'm going to do is let's do a slight inset. Click, hold, and drag. Pull in a little bit. Switch over here to the extrude tool. I'm going to pull down just a little bit. Come back over here to the inset faces. Now I'm using, I'm invoking the tool. 
I could just hit one, but I'm invoking the tool specifically so you always kind of know where it is that I'm going. Click, hold, and drag. Pull in just a little bit because we're producing a boundary right here. Release the mouse. Click, hold, and drag again. And we're going to come inward a ways like this. Now, it wouldn't let me kind of go any further, so I'm just going to press the S key to scale in about like that. Okay, so I'm going to do it one more time. Click, hold, and drag to pull inward. And here, we're going to move this down. About like that. I'm going to press the S key to scale up just a little bit. And then we're going to, we're going to use the bevel tool again. Click, hold, and drag. And this time, we're just going to let that same bevel operator with the same settings that we had before create that dish shape in there. Okay, switch back over to edge mode. Double click this edge. Let me zoom in a bit so we can see this. Now here we want to switch back to two segments, one on either side of the existing line, and we want this to be a value of one, which means it leaves this original edge in its place and it just puts a boundary set of polygons on either side of it. Such a useful function. While we're in edge mode, I'm going to double click this edge right here. This edge set, this, this loop of polygons right here, they're planar to here. And I don't want the subdivision of these small polygons to come deep into here. In fact, let's turn on subdivision. Let's come back and add a subdivision modifier. And I'm going to set this to a value of 2. And I'm going to turn off optimal display so we can kind of see this. What I want to do is come up to edges here. And we're going to invoke the edge crease function. This is such a useful, cool tool. And then you just start mousing left to right till you see all of those subdivided poly polygons reach that boundary point. And you can just double check it by making sure it's a value of one. And that just constrains the topology to make sure we're only getting curvature up to that point. And then it's nice and flat with inside of here. So let's do the same thing over here. Let me turn back optimal display. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to disable subdivision temporarily. I'm going to, I'm going to double click this edge right here. Let me turn it back on now so we can see it and press shift and E and then we can invoke that crease function. You can see, you can just keep mousing. It'll move the mouse across the screen like that until you hit the value of one and that just creases it. Make sure we don't get subdivision going into this planar region. Okay, so let's come down to the bottom. You can see the subdivision is unconstrained down here. Let me turn that off again. So I'm going to select in face mode. This, we're going to use the inset face function. Click, hold, and drag. I'm going to pull in just a little ways. Then we're going to come over to the extrude function. I'm just going to pull up. This is going to be the inside, so I'm not too worried about it. So I'm just going to pull up sort of an arbitrary amount. And then I'm going to press the X key to delete the faces. Then we need to come over here. We're not going to really be seeing this. Come over to edge. And I'm going to double click this edge. And th this is such a stark example of it right here. In fact, let me turn off optimal display. I'm going to press shift E. You can see that subdivision surface constraint. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is there's a little ridge, a little lip down here. So we're going to come over to the loop cut tool and I'm going to loop cut, click, hold, and drag, and I'm going to pull that geometry down till it matches up roughly with my indicator right there. Then in face mode, I'm going to leave that tool because that's annoying. <laughs> Double click, come over to the extrude tool, but we want to go down to the extrude along normals function. Click, hold, and drag. And it's just up and down like that. And this is why I don't like to work with subdivision on oftentimes, because you're, you try and do something and the subdivision itself sort of visibly gets in the way. Now, if I wanted it to go out a little bit further, than how I have it, then you can just come over and use the shrink fatten function. Click, hold, and drag. 
and it'll move those out along the normal lines of each individual polygon. Okay, so then let's come back over to that loop cut tool. Click, hold, and drag, and we need to put a boundary set of polygons along the bottom down there. So this is another fantastic example. Let's come over here and turn subdivision back on. And in fact, here, I'm going to go to front view. We're going to look at this really close. I'm going to press Shift E, which is that crease function. And then I'm just going to mouse to the left. You can see those polygons snap in place right there. Okay, so they're not passing that boundary. It's awesome. We could also do that right here. Let's go ahead and do that Shift E, pull those in. Whenever you're doing hard body modeling, that crease function is fantastic for what we're doing here. Okay, so the cap itself is pretty done. That's awesome. And if you want, you could maybe set that render time up to three just to give yourself even a little bit more finesse around this way. We can look at it. All we need to do now is invoke Shade Smooth. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add the um, detail around here, which are the little ridges, the grip ridges. So what we want to do now is add the ridges I'm going to come over here and just take note of the fact that the cursor is at the center of the cap, and that's where we want it to be. I'm going to come over into the front view here, and let's switch over into a kind of a wireframe view just to declutter the view. And I'm going to turn on X-ray so that we can see through this easily. We want to add a new object that's going to become the basis for the ridge. So we're going to come over into add mode, and we're going to add a mesh that is a UV sphere. It's going to be pretty large, so we're going to come down here and I'm going to make this 0.25 inches. That's still pretty large, but it's okay. We can scale it. I'm going to press the S key, just bring that down in size. Now what we want to do is we want to switch over into polygon edit mode because the object's origin, where it's currently located, is at the same position as the cap center where the 3D cursor is. And when I tab to go into edit mode, now we can move the components of the polygon mesh without moving the origin. Okay, so I'm going to move it up there. Let me zoom way in here, and I'm going to press the S key to scale these down just a little bit more. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over into face mode. We're at inactive tool, but I want to swipe around them, so we're going to do select box. And I'm going to select around those bottom. Now, I want to move those independently of the top ones, so I'm going to right-click, and we're going to come down to Split to separate those, and then I can grab and move them. Now, I want to switch back into Edge Mode so we can bridge these two together, so I'm going to marquee around those two edge sets. I'm going to come over here and do that so you can see those two loops selected bring up the context menu, and then we're going to do a bridge edge loops operation. Okay, now let's come back into the front view right here. We've got rounding in the top here, and it's coming into this long flat area, and I would prefer to have two sets of bounding polygons on either side of that curving area. So I'm going to come over here to the loop cut function, click, hold, and drag, and move that about there. Move that down about like that. That works pretty well. Okay, so let's zoom out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a switch over here to the left view because we need to move this into proper position. So I'm going to switch over to face mode, press the A key to select all. And with the move tool, I'm going to have us move it over here so it's sitting right on the front, sort of intersecting like that. I'm going to select the bottom, and then we'll move that down. You can play with it. If you still feel it's too large, this is where you can play with it. I'm going to press the S key to scale that down a little bit more, and then I can reposition the heads until I get, until I get them into an artistic position that I like. So let's come into the front view here. I think that's going to work pretty well 
for our ridge object. So I'm going to press the tab key. Let's also right click on this to enable shade smooth. And what I want to do now is we want to come over here and notice that the object's origin is right there where we left it. That needs to be there. We're in local axis and it's important when you're about to do an array operation that you take note that your objects are in local orientation because we're going to have a separate empty object that's going to be sort of a secondary object here that we need to reference and they both need to have the same position and the same local orientation. So let's come over here now to add. We're going to come down empty and let's do an arrow. Again, it's going to be pretty enormous, so I'm going to set it to 0.5 inches. And when, when I look at the local axis and then I select the ridge, they're the same. So that's good. That's, that's the way it needs to be. I'm going to rename this ridge. And then the empty, we're going to call this ridge rotation axis. Okay, so now we're going to use an array object to get these into position. With the ridge object selected, we're going to come down and add a modifier to it, which is the array modifier. And by default, you can see that it's just generated two, which is the view count, which is the count we see right there. I'm going to change this to 64. It's kind of an arbitrary value, but I think that's a value that will work pretty well. But we don't want a relative offset. We want it to offset in a way that's relative to another object's transform values. And that's what this ridge rotation axis empty is. So we're going to come down with the ridge object still selected. We're going to enable object offset and we're going to select specifically ridge rotation axis empty here. Okay, now the fun part. First, we need to remember something. With this ridge object, if it has any scaling applied to it, like we have here, that'll throw things off. So I need to come over first and come down to Apply, Scale. Okay, that's important. Next thing with Ridge Rotation Axis, we can come over here and test it. Now when we rotate this, it translates that rotation to our duplicates. We're doing it freeform there. And what I really want to do is come down here and put in the correct value. 360 divided by 64 is 5.625. There we go. Switch over into shaded mode, and that is done for us. So there we go. Now, if I wanted that to be different, let's say I wanted it to be 128, then I would just divide 5.625 in half to get 28125. So for instance, if I wanted that to be thicker, we could come over here, type in 128, and then with our ridge rotation axis, we would just take that to 2.8125, and you could populate more of them. Pretty cool.